Hi guys, it is another hot, sticky, miserable, hot summer day in May here on Memorial Day weekend. That would make it Sunday morning, May 27th, 2018. So Sunday morning I really love because uh, it's the day I get to wear both hats. I get to be uh, that uh, I get to be that dirty old man with a toilet for a mouth who yells at his clueless moron subscribers over here on Humpty Dumpty Tribe. That would be Hambone Little Tail. And I get to be, uh, I hope, the serious journalist Sam Mitchell over on Collapse Chronicles. So uh, I get to put uh, my sermon on both channels so you can decide whether you want to uh, listen to Sam Mitchell or that uh, toilet-mouthed uh, hambone little tail. But whoever, whichever preacher you decide to listen to, today uh, what I'm going to be bringing you for today's Sunday sermon is I'm just going to the very last essay uh, by this fellow I've never heard of by name of Donald Worster uh, in a book that was given to me <coughs> by uh, Robert Jensen. Uh, journalism professor Robert Jensen uh, recommended this book highly and uh, gifted me with it. And I hope that maybe we can get Donald Worster interested in uh, coming on Collapse Chronicles for an interview. So who is Donald Worcester? Never heard of him. Donald Worcester is the honorary director of the Center for Ecological History at the University of Renmin of China. And he is also the Hall Distinguished Professor of American History Emeritus at the University of Kansas. He is the author of many books, including A Passion for Nature, The Life of John Muir, Dust Bowl, The Southern Plains in the 1930s, A River Running West, The Life of John Wesley Powell, The Wealth of Nature, Environmental History and the Ecological Imagination, and under Western Skies, Nature and History in the American West. So anyway, uh, an excellent book, Shrinking the Earth, The Rise and Decline of American Abundance. Uh, I see uh, Paul Ehrlich and Bill McKibben, above, among others, highly recommending uh, this book. What does Paul have to say about this book? Donald Worcester is one of the most thoughtful of all environmental historians. In Shrinking the Earth, he argues that the age of abundance is over and that limits on natural resources will be an, in, an increasingly sensual reality of our collective future. It is a sweeping narrative, beautifully written and eminently readable that has profound implications for how we think about our place in the world. And uh, I'm just going to go to the very last little wrap-up chapter and let Donald Worcester, uh, his very last chapter, Life on a pale blue dot. Take it away, Donald. <clears throat> I'm just going to read the whole thing here. The American spacecraft Voyager 1 is a, is, is a unique traveler in Earth annals. Launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida in August of 1977, it resembles a giant metallic insect weighing 1,200 pounds. The most striking part of its anatomy is a dish antenna. 
bulging like a great round mouth for communicating with its human creators, long boomed stick out in all directions like legs and feelers and on them are strapped various scientific instruments, a generator, cameras. This strange creature <coughs> was sent out to gather data on the planets Jupiter and Saturn along with their moons and has continued into interstellar space. Still on mission decades after liftoff, the craft is now 12 billion miles from home and traveling at 38,000 miles per hour. So back in 1990 as Voyager 1 approached the edge of our solar system nearly 4 billion miles from Earth, it received a command to turn its photographic equipment around and take pictures of what it was leaving behind. One of the cameras took 60 images and one of those images, snapped on Valentine's Day 1990, featured the Earth. The subject, however, had to be identified by experts because few amateurs looking at it would immediately say, that's us, that's where we are in the cosmos. To the untrained eye, the photo shows a vast darkness streaked with rainbow colors refracting from the metallic skin of the spacecraft. Almost invisible is a tiny pale blue dot accidentally highlighted in a vertical orange stripe. The dot covers a mere 0.112 of a pixel in a mosaic of 640,000 pixels. One tiny ambiguous dot that is Mother Earth. <clears throat> Originally, no one on the NASA team had planned to waste energy by, by taking those backward-looking photographs, which would contribute nothing to their scientific agenda. But then the most popular voice of science in the nation, Carl Sagan, uh, pressured the mission's leader to collect some images that might inform and impress the public mind. Uh, so, and hence these uh, historic pictures. <clears throat> these would not be the first photographs of the Earth taken from space. Astro astronauts on earlier manned expeditions to the moon had brought out their cameras and created memorable images too. The so-called blue marble picture taken in December 1972 from the Apollo 17 spacecraft became one of the most widely distributed icons in the history of photography. Taken at a distance of 28,000 miles from Earth, it shows our home planet as resplendent as a child's playground marble. It's bright, swirling blue and white colors created by the oceans and clouds that dominate the globe. There is land in the photo too, and a faint suggestion of life. The continent of Africa peeks through the clouds, all tawny soil and green forest, the birthplace of Homo sapiens. But what we do not see in the blue marble photograph or the one of a pale blue dot is that planet called in these pages Second Earth. The photos say that humankind has arrived at a different era with new ways of thinking about humanity and our place in the cosmos. Now the Earth is one unitary whole and yet smaller and more vulnerable than we ever imagined. From the perspective of Voyager 1, that tiny pinpoint of light suggests that here is your beginning and here is possibly your limit, at least as far into the future as we can see. It is not a picture to inspire grandiose visions. <clears throat> Photographs, art critics say, are constructs of feelings, not unmeditated truths. What we feel when we see an image 
varies in meaning from person to person as it touches individual emotions. True enough, but there can be no denying that the pale blue dot is a record of fact with little human intervention. From four billion miles away, the Earth is undeniably a very small speck in the solar system. If we could see ourselves from even further out, from Voyager 1's current position in space, that tiny speck would completely vanish in the boundless space of a hundred billion galaxies. Faced with such an unmediated truth, the cosmic minuteness of the place we call home, humans may have trouble absorbing this information. But the factual record will not go away. We may try to cling desperately to our geocentric and anthropocentric past, even try to reassert tattered religious traditions and insist that we earthlings must be the favored children of God, that the whole cosmos exists for our benefit, and that we stand in the center of everything. The facts reported by a robot camera, nonetheless, do not support those claims and cannot be evaded. Inevitably, we are being forced to make a change in our consciousness as big or bigger than the ones Darwin and Copernicus set in motion, further decentering ourselves in the universe. Earlier changes induced by heliocentric astronomy and evolutionary biology, powerful though they were, could not in the end offset the message of Second Earth and its promise of natural abundance. It is impossible to say exactly when that promise and the confidence it induced began to lose ground, but it seems to be ending right now when the factual record shouts our vulnerability. When we look bleakly into the darkness of outer space while fearing that Earth's oceans will inexorably rise and flood our cities. Christopher Columbus and his three small wooden ships reached the Bahamas in October 1492, just shy of 500 years before the Voyager 1's photos were taken. The discovery of a new world helped ignite cataclysmic upheavals in science, technology, cultural and economic development, and globalization. It ignited multiple revolutions. The dramatic expansion of knowledge through science, the rise of modern capitalism, the industrialization of production, the exploitation of new sources of energy, and the invention of such modern political ideologies and institutions as liberalism, communism, and democracy. All of those revolutions fed on an enormous expansion in the natural resource base. New ideas and institutions, this book has argued, do not emerge out of a material vacuum. They are not self-generated, nor free and independent of the natural world. They evolve as the earth evolves, and as people move from place to place, encountering new possibilities or new limitations, responding to new information and opportunity. What new ideas and institutions will emerge on the earth as we are now beginning to understand it? A decisive material fact of our time is that our home planet is ecologically shrinking because of our growing technology, population, and consumption. 
while its average diameter still measures 8,000 miles and its surface area is still about 200 million square miles, Earth's capacity to support life has not increased. In fact, it has diminished. The global systems that have long sustained the evolution of life and human civilization are being seriously disturbed by our numbers and activities. Those systems, those earth systems that support us, no longer sustain, sustain the demands we make on them. Ideas and institutions are being intensely challenged by that predicament and eventually they will crack apart. Now we can see with blinding clarity one further fact. The Earth is only a tiny rock floating in a universe of countless rocks, big and small, of great gaseous spirals gyrating across the heavens, of tumultuous magnetic storms, and of empty space and more space. Yet for all the size and grandeur of the universe, there is no place for us humans to go except where we are. We are stuck on our little rock. We can send out a spacecraft like Voyager 1, but we cannot ride on it. This time technology does not open up immense profitable frontiers of natural resources, untapped oceans filled with fish, deep deposits of coal or uranium, or atmospheres rich in oxygen. It may be that the Earth is not the only rock in the universe providing some or all of the conditions of life, but it is the only one we absolutely know we could survive on. Mercury and Venus are incredibly hot and toxic to us. Mars, on the other hand, is frigid and bombarded with ultraviolet radiation, making it nearly impossible for any form of life to evolve or survive there. All the outer planets are more unlivable yet. As for the rest of the universe, whatever favorable environments it may contain are completely out of reach. We cannot get to them anytime soon or perhaps ever. It took Columbus a couple of months or so to cross the Atlantic Ocean by sail, leaving Spain on August 3rd in 1492, sighting the Bahamas on October 12th and making landfall on Cuba on October 28th. A couple of months would not get us very far into outer space, even if we could travel at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second or 670 million miles per hour, we would need more than four years to reach the nearest solar system, Proxima Centauri, but we cannot get to the next solar system in a mere four years for the fastest we can travel is a mere fraction of the speed of light. Voyager 1, the fastest moving craft we have ever launched, will take 80,000 years to reach Proxima Centauri. And if it does in fact ever arrive, it will surely be silent when it gets there. Will there be anyone left here on Earth to listen. With manifest disappointment, the astronomer Carl Sagan admitted, the Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to which our species could migrate. Visit, yes. Settle, not yet. Like it or not, for the moment, the Earth is where we make our stand." Close quote. That acknowledgement by a self-confessed space enthusiast so eager to explore and travel beyond the Earth should end all science fiction fantasies about space colonization. Any visiting of other planets 
will likely come far into the future if ever even sending out a tiny number of visitors beyond the moon or Mars is a hopeless idea but if we could do so would putting a man or woman on another planet for a few hours or even days really be worth the immense cost? Perhaps a hundred or two hundred years from now we may change our mind, but by then we may have the technical and economic means to send an entire colony of men all the way to Proxima Centauri. But then what? Will they find there an inhabitable planet? Or will they have to go on to the next solar system or the next? How many more centuries may it take before a successful band of immigrants can send home a glowing report from another Earth? Sagan, while admitting the difficulties confronting any human expansion beyond this planet, glimpsed the cultural consequences of seeing the Earth from outer space. He was right. They are and will be shattering. Perhaps we should speak not merely of cultural consequences, but of counter-consequences. A broader awareness of our, of our position in the cosmos may return us in some ways to where we were more than five centuries ago. We may experience a radical undoing of those ideas and institutions that have come to define our life on Earth. If we realize we cannot easily leave our home planet, we might find ourselves returning to ancient ways of thinking about land, water, and other forms of life, climate, and the Earth as our dwelling place. Perhaps the chief global animating modern life, first in Europe and the Americas and now globally, has been to achieve infinite growth in money and possessions. This goal has found its most powerful expression in the doctrines and institutions of capitalism, especially during the past century or so in Britain, the United States, Japan, and now China. What will happen to that quest for endless growth? The prospects for pursuing endless growth on a shrinking, vulnerable planet are fading fast, forcing us to rethink the purpose of human existence. No people will be more shocked by a turn away from that modern way of thinking than those who have lived longest by it. Nations that have been used to living by the simplest of means right down to the present should not find it so hard to understand that abundance is not endless, whereas people in Western societies, especially in the United States, which have been so firmly devoted to the ideology of capitalism and so blessed in natural abundance may find it nearly impossible to adjust. How will the role and ethos of modern science fare henceforth in the universe it has helped us discover? Rather than pushing society toward growth and conquest, as it so often has done in the past, science may find a new purpose, restoring the resilience of Earth systems and finding ways to live more sustainably within their limits. Already this may be happening as science increasingly turns itself into an agent of environmental protection. I'm sorry, I forgot what channel I was on. Anyway, uh, pretend y'all didn't hear that. Uh, that looks like cultural adaptation at work reflecting a radical shift in material conditions, although we cannot predict how far that will go or whether science will continue to enjoy the exalted position it has held over the past few centuries. 
The ideals of liberty and democracy may also face unprecedented challenges and may not survive as we have known them in a society that allows a high degree of personal freedom and individualism sustain is a society that allows a high degree of personal freedom and individualism sustainable when the material horizons begin to shrink and ecological systems to unravel? Answers are not yet apparent but it is possible that the future may bring new social hierarchies into existence or more authoritarian governments that promise to move quickly to enforce limits. It may even be that mass democracy will be dismissed as unworkable. On the other hand, our descendants over the next few centuries might choose to redefine democracy in less fragmented individualistic terms, not as a political culture devoted to freeing the individual from all restraint, but instead as a culture that embraces restraint for all. Already a creeping fear that social coercion is gaining ground has polarized American politics. The split between increasingly angry parties, one libertarian and one communitarian, may reflect that we live at the beginning of a post-abundance world and are feeling the tensions that will stir. Above all, the recent fact-based discoveries of our minuscule place in the cosmos and our ongoing environmental crisis on our little planet seem likely to diminish the importance of being human. For centuries we have celebrated ourselves as an exceptional species separate from and free to transform the natural world around us. Now that view seems illusory and self-destructive. We are less important than we thought. All the religions, ideologies, and economic doctrines invented by us, Sagan writes, all the kings and peasants in our history now shrink in significance. We cannot avoid seeing ourself as one flawed species among many joined with others on a moat of dust hurtling through space. To use Sagan's words, quote, the folly of human conceits, close quote, may be the hardest truth of our time to absorb. Over the past five centuries, the study of human history made great advances, although often expressed with anthropocentric certitude. History was commonly understood to be the record of our species' triumphant march towards progress, wealth, moral enlightenment, and dominance of the planet. We were on our way to what some have recently been calling the Anthropocene, an epic in which the entire Earth is managed and controlled by our brains. If the term Anthropocene means that we humans wield enormous influence on Earth, it is hard to deny its appropriateness. If, however, Anthropocene means that we have established a permanent empire and may now live as gods, the term may be an illusion. Our triumphs have ironically brought us to the point of seeing our own insignificance. The very idea of history is, with fits and starts, going through a metamorphosis today. 
the history we write in the future may start not with the rise of human civilizations, but with the deeper origins of the universe, putting off until late in the story the appearance of a tiny mammal on a tiny planet that thought itself supremely important. The little one involved a consciousness and learned to keep records and reflect on the changes it experienced. For a brief moment, it spread out to occupy all the land masses on its home planet, circling around an obscure star. On the last of those land masses, lying enticingly in the western hemisphere of their globe, humans expanded as fast and furiously as they could. They wrote down every detail of their exploits and dreamed of achieving an infinite splendor. But then, one day, their brains discovered the sobering truth that they face many limits. The universe while infinite, is not infinite for them. Amen. Brother Donald Worcester, Shrinking the Earth, The Rise and Decline of American Abundance. And as I say, I will be uh, asking uh, Donald Worcester if he would kindly uh, grace us here on Collapse Chronicles with a conversation to uh, further explain uh, the, um, the coming collapse of civilization and the planet. But, read it. Bye guys.